to Dance Wars, um, a conversation place number 10. I'm Sarah Tutt from Dance 4 and I'm delighted today to be joined by choreographer Sean Ed Hughes and a uh, reader in architectural theory at Nottingham University, um, Dr. Jonathan Hale. Uh, so, Dr. Jonathan Hale, can I start uh, perhaps with one of the questions you might have for Sean Ed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> yeah, I'd like to ask um, uh, what, uh, what Sean Ed's been doing and her, uh, about her experience in uh, working in, in Japan because um, from what I've seen or what you've told me already uh, about the work you've been doing there it seems like there's something really interesting in relation to the traditional dances which you've been uh, learning le and people you've been learning from and you wrote something in, um, in, in one of your texts about um, how you feel about new dances in relation to um, uh, traditional dances which you've been working with and you even asked the question as to whether we really need new dances when perhaps we don't yet understand uh, the ones we already have and I just wondered if that was a particular if, is that a, a, a perspective which has come from your experience working in Japan or is that something that you already felt or something you brought to the, uh, to this, uh, to the experience you're having now? Yeah, I don't think it's specifically related to my um, time in in Japan. It's something that's always perhaps been in my thinking or my thoughts or the relation of dance to environment or landscape or, or memory or where dances come from um, in terms of our thinking. And that's not only about tradition or something past or from the primitive or what is communication th through dance, uh, I mean through generations as well. Because um, in a way we wouldn't be here having this conversation if it wasn't for the whole story or history of, of dance also. Um, and also perhaps to do with human communication. And when I speak about new dances, I think what I mean is um, perhaps in the contemporary dance or quite often in seeing works, perhaps I feel that nothing is new anymore. Everything has been done by now. <laughs> um, and sometimes when you see new works, I actually see something that perhaps it reminds me of another work or something that I've seen in the past and then perhaps it becomes a little problematic because I feel perhaps we're not referencing enough what has been before us which has allowed us to be where we are now. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of a looking back to move forwards. Mm -hmm. So perhaps when I came to Japan, um, I met something very similar in my thinking towards dance. Mm -hmm. Does that yeah. make any sense to uh, you yeah. at all? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does make sense. Uh, but it leads on to a question about uh, something I, I, I'm interested in in your work is uh, where it where it fits in well it's a question, I should phrase this as a question, does it fit into a, a larger process which is um, where this might be a step where you're, you're learning of a traditional dance what to me it seems in a very um, a very careful and a very faithful way uh, at the moment you seem to have just immersed yourself, not just sorry, you seem to have immersed yourself in that particular culture and in, in learning and going through the discipline of learning um, staying very faithful to the original or if, if I, you can maybe not even use the term original but the way in which the dance exists as it does now. Um, do you see that as part of a process whereby you would take something from that that you would then somehow develop into something which is perhaps more like a piece of contemporary dance? I mean do you see it as part of feeding into your own practice as a, as a choreographer in developing new pieces that are somehow based maybe not based on, but somehow sort of draw through some ideas or themes or somehow get reinterpreted in, in new pieces that you might make in, in the future? I think what, it, what interests me is like 
peeling away the layers of, um, I think sometimes we kind of read tradition as a costume worn, a sound heard, or a musical instrument, and then we kind of place it in, oh, that's traditional, or, um, and also perhaps what's happening to traditional forms in this pres present time is that also the traditional forms are starting to change because they want to please the contemporary society, which is seen as, so you have to be new in some way, uh, mm -hmm. up-tempo, uh, more entertainment, more, more display. Mm -hmm. So um, what interests me about Kakina Izawa, Shishi Odori, is they're not, then they're not pandering to this way. It, they're keeping to the form, to its kind of um, what is its its basis. So you could say it's like the foundation of a house. If you don't have the foundation, then you don't have the house. You don't have the building. It will fall apart. It will exist for a short while. So I kind of yeah, I'm looking at what is the foundation of this, and when you peel away all the layers and you just present it simply in the form that it is. Um, because what I'm learning in this dance is actually you learn by sound first. You have to be able to say, um, it's not, they call it a shoga. And it's almost like a chant or a prayer or a, um, it's actually the drum beat that you will play eventually. Mm -hmm. But you have to know it by memory first. Uh, so perhaps what I do is I reframe. Not I don't want to change anything of the original dance, but I peel away the layers to reveal its architecture, if you like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whereas yeah, actually, hmm. no, I was going to ask you. Um, sorry for interrupting, but um, oh, no. one thing that interested me in what you um, uh, what you what you had on your uh, website there was a video of uh, the piece that you just mentioned, the uh, the deer dance, which you were performing with a group in what looked like a, a theatre space, looked like a, in a way a kind of western sort of typical theatre, proscenium mm -hmm. kind of theatre space. Um, I wondered if that was typical in terms of the way that dance is performed normally or has been performed, or whether you, one could see that as a, as a sort of shift of context, whether you were taking the dance and perhaps presenting it in a way that it hadn't been presented before, or if not, or other, were there other examples, because I had a sense from some of the other work that you've done in the past, uh, where you did seem to be playing with that idea of um, decontextualizing and then sort of recontextualizing, taking pieces mm -hmm. and performing them uh, in mm -hmm. a range of different locations, and often outside, in public spaces. And um, mm -hmm. so I was just curious about that particular dance, whether that is one that would traditionally have been performed in a, in a more formal kind of theatre space, or whether that was one that you'd perhaps taken from a public, what would normally be a public open space, perhaps, in the centre of a village or, you know, in, a, in part of a community, and whether you'd taken that into a theatre space, and that that was beginning to open up some, some different uh, interpretations of the, of the piece. No, because that was actually Kakinai Sawa Shishi Odori, that was in February. Um, no, I saw them last year, and that was also in a theatre context where I saw them, and I was um, just kind of so touched by them, this dance. Mm -hmm. It took me some time to find a way to get in contact with them and to ask mm -hmm. them if I could study with them. Um, so it was actually them that said, okay, um, we're starting rehearsals in January, and we have, a, um, we have a performance in February, so you can join us. So it was them who invited me into that and into the stage context, mm -hmm. which is totally not the context that this dance exists in. Or, um, because uh, the reason of the dance is it's normally danced in a garden or outside a house where um, somebody has died. So it's kind of a, um, how do you say, it's like to comfort the soul of a... Uh, um, mm -hmm. Mm. Someone that just passed away, or mm. so it's completely not a theatre context usually. 
And actually, just this last Saturday, um, we danced, uh, danced it in its in its real context, and that's quite different. <laughs> mm. um, yeah, it's the completely different, uh, yeah, experience, and I think it's to do also with the participation of the viewer. Whereas, uh, yeah, in its kind of original context. It's in an outside context, and um, there's a participation in the ritual itself. It's not about looking or watching or for entertainment or, yeah. Yeah. It's more about participation. Everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting because that that connects to uh, another question that I had, which I wanted to ask you about. Which is to do with the the larger kind of geographical context that you're you're talking about and that you're working in and uh, well you're living in uh, at the moment uh, in this northern part of Japan, which I understand was quite badly affected by the earthquake and tsunami uh, a few years ago. And you talked about um, the fact that many people have been made homeless, of course, by these events and were perhaps living in temporary accommodation. And I just wondered about uh, that aspect that you mentioned—the ritual and the communal aspect of the participation in the in the dance performance uh, that you mentioned. Uh, whether that's tr always had a, a kind of um, uh, a role in perhaps almost creating space or making people feel as though um, they they belong in a place or almost bringing a place into existence. Would would you? Say there was a sort of we would call that uh, I guess in architecture in in ge geography anthropology people would call that a kind of performative understanding of of place making, which tries to get us beyond thinking of static places just as buildings or static landscapes, and to see the way that places are brought to life by the activities that that take place as they say uh, within them. And it sounded like what you were suggesting there is that those the dances have traditionally had a, a, a quite a had a, an important part to play in in that process of, if you like, of of place making. I think yes, I completely um, agree with you on on this uh, place making. Let's see, because I was so anxious and so worried about coming here in two thousand and thirteen because I really thought what. What can art or culture do in such a terrible, terrible situation where people have just lost everything, you know, family, home, and have been displaced on so many different levels? Mm. But by now, I'm completely um, changed. You know, um, people's culture, culture and arts is where they. Is where our dignity lies, and um, and I don't know. There was one like Rikusen Takada Ondo, because uh, Rikusen Takada is a city that is just five kilometers from here, mm -hmm. and it was wa completely washed away in like six minutes. Um, mm. So my connection with people, I can only rely on people, and um, and I think this is the beauty of fans also. Because there is no picture, there is no image. It's lived in the moment, and the moment is always passing. So you have to value that moment with everybody. Um, so when I came here for the first time, you know, people were saying it's, it's been three years we haven't danced, and they really are from a culture where dance really is a part of their culture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was introduced to Rikusen Takada Ondo, and even geographically, this dance and song tells me where I am. <laughs> um, but in terms of also where people are emotionally, emotionally in terms of what they have lost, um, you know, there's the Matsubara from Rikusentakata. It's the seventy thousand pine tree forest, um, and it was completely washed away by, by the tsunami, but the, the song and the dance is very descriptive of the landscape, the feeling, the social, the um, yeah, recognition of 
kind of ancestry. Um, mm -hmm. So we've just had moments together where we've come together in, you know, just outside, anywhere. Because even to get a few people together, it's really because there's no infrastructure anymore. Mm -hmm. There's no transport. There's no, you know. Um, so the value of these moments, it just brings me back again to the beauty of dance and what dance is and what that moment is that you can never catch it. And it's so true to our lives. Each second we're alive, you know, it's passing. We're all getting older. So this thing of, um, yeah, it makes place. I mean, you know, you can dance anywhere and with anybody. It doesn't matter where. Um, so it's a celebration of life itself, or kind of mm -hmm. understanding what it is to be alive. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, I'd like, yeah. like to a perfect place to finish on. Um, thank you so much. That was really, really fascinating, and I'm I'm very aware that there is a lot more to say about this, and there have been such interesting ideas that I think that we can certainly unpick further, so I hope that I will have the pleasure of bringing you both back to continue this conversation another time. But uh, in the meantime, I just want to thank you, Jonathan, and thank you, Seaned, for um, a really interesting a conversation place. That's great. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. That's great. Yes, me too. Nice to meet you, Jonathan. Mm, and you, yes. Thanks a lot. <laughs>